Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. My name is Ted Forbes. Today in our video, we are talking about the future of photography. In just a second, we're gonna get into rocket ships, spacemen, uh, let's see, what else, robots, um, food processors, anyway, I'm kidding. Uh, anyway, I thought this would be an interesting topic to cover today, but before we do, I wanna say thank you to the folks that sent emails this week and gave some suggestions to some more theoretical stuff that they wanna learn about photography. I'm not going to give away everything today here, but I want to give you guys a heads up. I'm gonna do a full announcement video when I have the ideas flushed out, but we are gonna make some changes to the format of the show coming up, and don't worry, um, the podcast that comes out weekly will stay the same, but one of the things that I've wanted to do for a while now I never gotten around to is when we distribute the show on YouTube the audience is a little bit different than it is on the podcast that's distributed through iTunes and these shows tend to run pretty long in the grand scheme of things so around 20 minutes to 30 minutes or so and so when I look at my analytics on that obviously the average viewer tends to start dropping off at about the six minute mark which means that there's a dedicated core of you guys who enjoy watching the entire episode and then there's another group of people that start to get bored with me just yakking on and on for after about six minutes so what I want to start doing is is you know we've got summer coming up um, I'm done traveling for a a little while here for a couple months so I've got some time and what I want to do is probably bring back the vlog episodes that come out in the middle of the week and probably some shorter content that's just kind of really designed for YouTube so don't worry I'm going to leave the podcast as it is but we do have some changes coming up on that front I just would like the show to evolve a little bit and grow its appeal and get you know more viewers and more people that are into it that can join the conversation that uh, you know the more the merrier so anyway that stuff is coming up and I will make an announcement when we get a little closer to but to our topic today, I want to talk about the future of photography. And what I'm going to do is I've got some notes put together on this. Um, surprisingly enough, this is something that I get asked about a lot in various ways um, via email and tweets and stuff. And usually it's a lot of people, you know, that would say, what do you think about this or a certain style or, or a lot of questions about what's going on in contemporary photography. And I want to try to address some of this today. And it's kind of a fun hypothetical discussion that we can do. So um, let me take a break here. I'm going to get my notes together and we're going to discuss the future of photography. All right, so the genesis of this discussion really actually came out of a conversation I had a couple months ago. It was at a holiday party. And it was interesting because it was through the museum that I work for. And um, it was one of those things where I went and actually there was the gentleman who showed up. His name is Bert Finger. And he owns an art gallery in Dallas called Photographs Do Not Bend. And they deal in a lot of Keith Carter's work. Uh, they've dealt in Abelard and Morel and a lot of contemporaries. And I've never met Bert face to face. And I was really actually kind of excited to sit there and kind have a conversation with him and one of the things we discussed uh, he had asked about the podcast and the show and stuff and you know I asked him a lot about what he does and as a gallery owner he does a lot of educational work where he'll go to schools and talk to you know pretty much all ages and he said his favorite level was younger kids because they have less expectations about you know what art can be or what photography can be and we were talking about a little bit of where photography's going um, you know he gets asked an enormous amount of questions about you know young photographers who want to break into doing gallery work and how do they go about that and you know we started talking about you know what do we see as the future of photography and one of the things that whether you agree with this or not I think it would be interesting to know so please leave a comment or send an email or something but one of the things that he said in there was that you know he found that if you follow photography from the technology side of things where we are now with digital photography and what you can do with Photoshop and I'm going to come back around to this in a second really far exceeds what we could do with darkroom in the past and that he believed that what we're going to start seeing in the future is a really big abstraction of photography where it's really hard to tell that it may be even a photo it becomes more like abstract expressionism or something like that so while I think that is certainly a very valid point um, and after giving it four months of thought uh, after that initial conversation. Um, you know, one thing that it, I found it's interesting if we look at where we are in the context of history, and you guys know I'm a big history nerd and I love photography and I love the great tradition that comes before it. And I believe that, that any visual artist, um, you know, that's part of being an artist is understanding where you are in that continuum of that place and time what came before you um, where culture and society are currently what you have to say about that and where it's going and that's what defines us as artists as much as we probably would like to just come up with new innovative stuff that nobody's ever seen blow their minds and be the most famous person alive it doesn't work that way and people who certainly are innovators and push through that they they do fall into that pocket of where they are in the continuum and so I think that's one thing I think another Another thing to consider too is in general 
humans don't like a lot of change. And you know, you notice this the most with consumer products, like you know, if Apple changes a smartphone interface or Samsung, or, you know, whatever, um, people tend to complain and, and they don't like it at first and, and they move around. And I think art is really no different. Now, real quick, I also want to define what I'm talking about as being actual art. And I'm talking about, I, I don't like the term fine art. I had a conversation with somebody this week about that. Uh, but, you know, art that's designed to be art and, you know, it may have some kind of commercial value to it or monetary value, but it is not done, you know, as a commission for something. So I'm not talking about necessarily, you know, product photography or, you know, contracted photography, um, wedding photography, things like that. Those those tend to be things that will follow trends. It doesn't, I'm not trying to insult them. I'm just saying that they're not um, what I'm determining to be culturally significant fine art. Um, so anyway, so, you know, I'm going to make some references also to visual artists from the past, and we'll get into that in a second. I'll show you some images as well. But anyway, in general, I think that people tend to resist change. And years ago, um, when I, my, back in my music days, when I was a music student, there was a book that I read, and I will put links in all the show notes to these two, so if you're interested in reading further. But there's a Nicholas Slonimsky book called the, I believe it's called The Lexicon of Musical Invective. And it's a wonderful book, and what it is, is it's a, it's a um, collection of famous reviews, <laughs> really scathing bad reviews of very famous pieces. So um, he actually went back and collected, you know, what journalists were writing about, you know, trashing Beethoven's Ninth Symphony when it came out and the first time they heard it. And that's almost, you know, ridiculous for us to think about now, thinking about Stravinsky or Beethoven or any of the famous, you know, music composers throughout, you know, history um, as, you know, something being bad or being shocking, particularly Beethoven. But, you know, that was the case, you know, and so it's a collection of bad reviews of famous uh, you know, classical composers through history. And I think that gives you an interesting perspective too because sometimes the first time we see something it's a little shocking, it's a little strange, and sometimes there's a pretty terse reaction that comes out of a lot of that. Um, if you look at visual art, and I think that it's important to do that because one thing I think photography has been at to this point, and this isn't uh, a bashing of it, but as photographers we tend to be a little bit insular. Um, in the fine art world we're one of the redheaded stepchildren, so to speak, where you know we have this thing where it's not hand skills or drawing, it's shooting a picture, and there are skills that come out of that, we all know that, but there tends to be a constant justification of what is photography. So, you know, um, this goes all the way back to the invention of photography versus drawing, um, the early uh, experiments with photo manipulation with darkroom, um, even some of the alternative process altering an image and today with Photoshop and sometimes with photojournalists uh, becomes f controversial if somebody alters a picture when it's being delivered as news or truth or fact or um, you know something that's being documented so anyway having said that um, I think it's interesting to look at uh, painters because you know if you look at well and maybe I, painters is not really the term I want to use anymore because if you look at, at artist, so to speak. Uh, what defines art anymore? I mean, paint kind of comes in and out of fashion. Uh, drawing and hand skills kind of come in and out. But specifically, I think there's two references that I want to make. And the first one is Jackson Pollock. And, you know, any of the Abax artists that came out of New York in the 40s and 50s, and what they were doing, um, the, you know, in their place and time and their cultural definition. And you have these guys that are a little too old to be in the military and to be fighting in war. Um, and post-war, they looked at a certain way. A lot of them were alcoholics. Uh, you know, you read the biographies on Pollock and he was a little bit of a mess. But one of the things that he did was this extremely significant, extremely innovative um, turn to painting where you have abstract expressionism. And if you're not familiar with Jackson Pollock, he did these drip paintings where literally with, with things like sticks and turkey basters and paintbrushes, he put the canvas on the floor and throw paint at it and drip. And he did these, these huge abstract paintings and what they are is, you know, it became termed as abstract expressionism being this raw expression of what the photographer was trying to, or sorry, the, the artist was trying to do with the canvas. And in Jackson's case, which was actually the physical nature of just chucking paint at it. He's not doing anything that's a definite, um, you know, something you can recognize like a human figure or a portrait necessarily. It's abstracted and it's this raw expression of, you know, the relationship of the artist and the paintbrush in his case. Um, I think another radical shift is what we're seeing currently, and the artist I want to use as an example is a gentleman that I've actually had the pleasure of meeting, and I think he's one of um, the more talented, and, and you know, he's obviously very hot right now, uh, but Mark Bradford, who is a young artist from Los Angeles who's having a tremendous amount of success right now, and Bradford does these ginormous pieces. Um, they look to be paintings. Um, they're definitely abstract. And the interesting thing about Mark Bradford is when you get closer, you realize that he's using ripped off sheets of like billboard ads that he finds on the streets of LA. And there's a real urban 
uh, aesthetic that comes into play, but the way he pieces these together and the complexity, they end up being collaged and they make these beautiful abstracts that just really kind of like, you know, take you back when you look at these, particularly when you see them further away or up close, kind of like Impressionism does in some ways. And what you're seeing now is one, another redefinition because Bradford's not really painting these, they're collected, um, they're pasted together, so they're collaged. Certainly the artist is involved in the creation of these things, they don't create themselves, but it really defined, or redefines what we're doing in terms of materials, in terms of aesthetic, um, you know, those kinds of things. We really haven't seen a lot of that in photography necessarily because I think uh, as soon as something is divorced from the camera, it becomes, well, as soon as it's taken away or abstracted, we tend to not define it anymore as photography. But back to Bert Finger's comment that he was making to me at this holiday party that, you know, this is what we're having a hard time seeing as the future. One, we're living right now in a cultural shift that started probably in the 80s with, you know, this remix generation when you have sampling that's introduced into music, particularly hip hop, rap, um, a lot of the early electronic music that came out of Detroit at that time. And, you know, again with the music comparison, but, you know, it, it has kind of turned this into a generation of remix um, where everybody may be an, considered an artist, um, whether or not they have any experience with it or not. And that is everything from, you know, making memes online or, uh, you know, it becomes very complex. And there certainly is an element to some of those things that is photography based. Where is this going to go? And some of us may not like that definition. I think if you compare this to, um, you know, when Kodak made it accessible for everyone to shoot pictures on film, all of a sudden it was like, you push the button, we do the rest. And Kodak did nothing compared to what smartphone designers did when Apple released the iPhone and the Android phones came out and followed suit. Everyone has a camera now, not just somebody who happens to go out and buy a camera to be a camera. You have a camera that's part of another device that you just happen to use every day, which is your phone. And so photography being in the hands of the people is way more true than it has ever been. And then within the digital realm, let's be honest, Photoshop does way more, way more, even, um, I'm not gonna compare Lightroom because it's slightly different, but Photoshop where you can actually manipulate things does way more than you could ever do in a dark room. It does it cleanly, it does it in a compact computer type situation, it does it instantly, um, it's quick. And so what we may see between where we are now with remix culture and people that, you know, artists are less defined as, as certain people um, who have a talent, it's more of a kind of an everyman kind of thing, is what we're starting to see, where that's gonna go is we shape the future. I'm not saying it's good or bad. I'm not, I'm leaving my opinion out of it, but I'm just trying to make an educated guess of what we're seeing now based on where we've been and where we may going. So, you know, Bert could be completely correct in saying that maybe, um, you know, photo manipulation is going to be another thing and it's going to bring that layer of abstraction and change much in a similar way as you see with somebody like Jackson Pollock or maybe a Mark Bradford more recently. And those are just two more or less popular but still seemingly random examples that I picked from the fine art world. And what have we really seen with that with photography? And I don't think we've seen those limits get pushed necessarily. Um, I think that some of the things that we have seen in the photography world in the last 10 to 20 years that have been kind of different. Um, if you're familiar with, and again, I'll put links in the show notes, but the German photographer Thomas Strut, um, who does kind of this split thing. They're not abstracts at all, but his work kind of falls into two categories. And it's, it's um, you know, kind of a German tradition, but you see these landscapes that are very urban in nature. They're cityscapes often. He did one in my city in Dallas. Um, and one thing you're going to notice in all these shots is they're very desolate. He, there's no people in them at all. So he completely removes that sense of humanity from a human type situation being an urban uh, center for a city or something like that. So you see that. Um, and then he also balances that with these odd portraits that he does. Um, and he's done friends of his, he's done relatively famous people, he's done no names. And what he does is they end up being these very cold pictures of people that are generally not smiling. And a lot of this work is actually kind of a throwback to the old wet plate days where you don't see people smiling in pictures and there's a certain feel coming off that. And the reason back then is that they were very long exposures. Sensitivity on wet plate was very slow. And so in order to take somebody's picture, in fact, if you've ever been to somebody who's really hardcore into wet plate and they have a studio, they used to actually make neck braces so people wouldn't move. And you put your head in the neck brace and be behind you and you'd stay perfectly still. They would tell you not to smile because your face would end up blurring if you moved at all. So it was a very still operation. And Strut applies that same technique. He does long exposures on modern photo photography equipment and film in his case. Um, 
and he does that same approach to it for an effect. So anyway, so what you see, I guess, and I'm using Strude as the example because um, it's photography that it's not abstract, but there's a conceptual abstraction to it. But and this is what I mean as photographers being kind of separated out from art um, to some degree, um, we cling to what is photography a lot. So. It is very possible too, on the flip side, I guess what I'm saying is that abstraction may not come into play at all. I don't know. What I wanna hear is I wanna hear your comments and I wanna know what you guys have to think. So leave a comment on this video if you are in a position to do so. Um, if you're not and you're watching this on your iPod and you're on a commute or on the road or something, then consider visiting our website and leaving a comment there. You can do so at theartofphotography.tv. And this is an interesting discussion. I sincerely do want you guys to comment on this and I wanna have this discussion with you because it's something that we could kind of revisit from time to time. And this is not one of those shorter episodes, obviously, but when we get into doing the shorter ones, maybe they can just be little ideas on things or reflections or responses or something like that. So anyway, I want to start kind of collecting some of those now. Anyway, if you got any questions, you know where to find me. Shoot me an email, hit me up on Twitter, the Facebook, the Instagram, your social media of choice. So anyway, guys, once again, this has been another episode of The Art of Photography or The Future of The Art of Photography. And I want to thank you guys for watching. We'll see you guys next time. Later.